Hi guys, can I get a sound check? We can hear you. Okay, great. Thanks, Colin. Okay, guys, uh, let's get started. First thing is, um, no, I had some, it's not, it's really at the introductory level. So it's not important that you guys have the slides per se for the class today, but I don't know, have you guys, are you guys able to see this document or grab it, the slide deck one that's in files? Or does it say it's unpublished or something? Uh, it said it's unpublished, unpublished for me. Hmm. Got to figure out how that works. Sorry, guys. I'm still trying to figure out how Canvas works. I'll, I'll, it's again, I'll, you guys can just look at it on my, I'm not even sure I'm going to go through it or just, you know, write some slides for you guys or write some stuff for you guys up today, but, um, I'll figure that out. How about if you go on announcements? Um, I couldn't figure out where to put the link for the video. Do you guys see something that says online videos? Yeah. And can you like, does that look like a link, something you guys can click on? But you can go to the video from lecture one. Uh, you can copy it and then paste it into a URL. Okay, so it's not like a link though? No. No. Yeah, I, I was able to click it and it brought me to YouTube. Oh, then? Okay. It was under the announcements section, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Well, okay, so one hit, one miss. Um, okay, we'll, we'll figure that out. Okay, so guys, let's get started. So, um, you know, today, um, again, we're still just kind of um, trying to get our arms around this topic, what it means, some of the fundamental concepts, but still it's kind of like touchy-feely stuff that, that we're, we're going to be talking about today. So um, the first thing I thought I would do is to um, just start by talking about something I was suggesting for you guys to do um, last time, which is to um, take a look at the Wall Street Journal um, every once in a while as a source for sort of your understanding what you're doing in the world and where the different what different companies are doing, perhaps the company that you're building or the company that you're part of, et cetera. So I thought, and there was a cool article uh, or cool for me, an interesting one. And it has an interesting uh, video that is kind of a good overall descriptor of how chips are made, et cetera, that we're gonna go through kind of in a little bit more detail in the next few lectures. So I thought I'd talk about that for a little bit. So let me share my screen here. Let's see. So can you guys see my screen that says Wall Street Journal, Intel lands Pentagon deal? Yeah, I could see that screen. Okay, great. So, so this is, you know, this is the online Wall Street Journal page and this is from the tech section. This is an article that came out a few days ago. It looked like I got updated uh, on the 23rd. But basically, so let me let me just sort of walk through this article with you, which I, I think is an interesting one. Um, so this talks about Intel, which you know probably a lot of you guys have heard about. You know their uh, processors. So I'll, I'll just sort of like go through this and give you guys hopefully filler in the background of 
the semiconductor business and what all this means. So anyway, so Intel has historically been the largest semiconductor manufacturer in the world. It is no longer, that's no longer the case. And that's part of the problem Intel is trying to address. And it's sort of discussed in this, in this uh, article. So where Intel was getting its strength was it would make microprocessors for Windows machines, Macs, et cetera, for basically computers, okay, and for servers. So cloud servers, those kind of things. For a long time, we're Intel microprocessor based. And also Intel not only had what it's called, what's called a vertical um, company, vertically integrated company, it means that it does the design of the chip and then it has its own manufacturing uh, facilities to make its chips. And then you know sells the chips to Apple and you know Dell and whoever you know these kind of guys. So it's been faced with some issues recently. So one of them is that um, that this model of being vertically integrated in the semiconductor business, or generally, but in the semiconductor business, sometimes it works in your favor and sometimes it doesn't, depending on how where the market's going. Recently, it's not been going in Intel's favor. So the, 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 sometimes it goes in your favor. The reason is, well, look, you've got, you're creating value at different parts of that value chain. You're creating value that you're designing the chip. You're creating the value that you're manufacturing the chip, et cetera. So you can, if you can get capture that value, meaning if you can get money, profits at every one of those stages, why would you want to share that with somebody else? Why would you want to just do the design, get the profit for that, and let somebody else do the manufacturing, let them get the profit for that? Why not just get everything? So that's one way of thinking about being vertically integrated. The nice thing is you can control, be a master of your own destiny, and so on, et cetera. Now, one problem with Intel has been that the model that's been more successful recently is a non-integrated model, meaning there is a model that's called the fabless semiconductor model. Fab is the manufacturing facility. This is the name for manufacturing facility for semiconductors. And fabless means you do not have your own manufacturing capability. So for example, NVIDIA is, a, is like that, which you know makes the graphic that's probably like, I don't know if NVIDIA may be the biggest semiconductor company now. Qualcomm down in San Diego that does chips for cell phones, et cetera. These guys do not have their own manufacturing capability. They give that to a third party. And there is one particular third party, which is based in Taiwan called TSMC. It's referred to in this video that's coming that because now they can aggregate manufacturing from a whole bunch of different companies. So Intel is just doing manufacturing of its own designs, but TSMC or these other fabulous companies, they can take manufacturings from multiple vendors. They have been able to be more successful in R&D and in developing new cutting edge technologies, which has Basically, they're way ahead of Intel now. So as you'll see, what's been happening, the reason you can get, uh, part of the reason you can get improvements in chip, uh, the number of transistors on a chip, chip speed, and a lot of things, is you make the transistors smaller and smaller. So that there's different generations of technologies and they usually have to do with making the transistor small. And again, we'll, we'll get into the details of why that's important. So Intel had a big hiccup in the 10 nanometer technology node. Okay, so 10 nanometers is 10 times 10 to the minus nine meters, small number. Okay, I think, um, you know, a typical like cell 
like a typical like human cell or something might be four or five times 10 to the minus six meters. So this is like, you know, a thousand times smaller than a cell, you know, I'm kind of, I don't know. So anyway, small number, 10 nanometers, okay? But the bleeding edge stuff at TSMC at this Taiwan manufacturer now is four or five nanometers. So they've already like two generations, almost three, going on three generations, more advanced than Intel. Just Intel had that hiccup. The other problem that Intel has been having is, if you guys have noticed, um, some of their customers, for example, Apple um, and some other ones is just RC are, are big enough and they're getting, you know, are starting to make their own custom chips. So the latest Apple, you know, laptops, et cetera, have the Apple M1 chip and not the Intel chip chip. So they're kind of losing their customer base and they were really never successful in getting into cell phone microprocessors and cell phones are a huge business, much bigger than now they're much bigger than uh, PCs in terms of, you know, the volumes and dollar amounts, et cetera. So they were just weren't able to make much headway in that. Um, there's other companies that make microprocessors. So anyway, this is a message. This is something about Intel, but you know, the one thing that Intel has going for it, just this particular point in time, is it's a US company and the US government is concerned about um, losing the bleeding edge semiconductor manufacturing capability. Again, the absolute bleeding edge, as you'll see referred to in this video, is in Taiwan in the form of this company, TSMC. Taiwan, I don't know how far away they're from the People's Republic of China, but for all events and purposes, they're, you know, like a stone's throw away, which is scary for the US. And you know, the second most advanced place is Samsung in South Korea. And again, South Korea is really close to China. So the US Defense Department, this article is about how um, there's a $2.3 billion funding requested for uh, defense spending. And you know, Intel looks like they're going to win that because they're the biggest company in the US. Another interesting thing that it says, is here that $2.3 billion or whatever is kind of a drop in the bucket still as large as that dollar amount is because it says Intel is planning to invest $20 billion, $20 billion in building out two new factories in Arizona. So imagine, so this is pretty typical now. Every new factory you want to build is seven, 10, maybe even more billion dollars to build a, a single factory for the semiconductor business. This is all because of the expensive equipment that you need in these factories, et cetera. So anyway, there's discussions about that, um, some other, et cetera, talking about their competition. So this is, you know, it's a pretty cool article given that it's a, this is a financial company essentially, but it it's giving you a real high level view of, you know, and there's links to Intel's problems and their, their R&D spending plans, what's, in, what's important for Intel, what is the, uh, you know, their new um, CEO is planning, etc. So whether you're working for Intel, whether you're a customer of Intel, whether you're buying PCs, um, all these kind of stuff, it's, uh, you know, you want to know what the, or let's say you want to know what the U.S. is planning to do for, you know, semiconductor com competitiveness, et cetera. A lot of it is really nicely addressed here. Okay, so now um, let me play this video. Now this video is talking about the steps in a semiconductor manufacturing, you know, to get you a, a semiconductor part. It's pretty good, real high level. We're going to dig into these details step, you know, in our in our uh, lectures. But I'll periodically stop it to make a few points. But let me go ahead and play this for you. There might be an ad that might start playing at the beginning. I apologize for that. Where is it?
kill the audio for the ad. No, just skip the ad. No, wait a minute. That's the wrong video. Don't have that. Why is it playing me the wrong way? The United States. Sorry, guys. Let's see if I can get it back. We can already move to the next video. Okay, let's try this. Sorry, I'm just trying to get through the ad here. Oops, no, I shouldn't have clicked on that. Okay. This chip controls your car, stores data about what you bought, and runs the software on your laptop. Can you guys see and hear this pretty well? Yeah, we could see well. Okay, great. These chips have come to power our lives, and only a handful of fabrication plants or fabs in the world have the know-how and infrastructure to move them. So most of the chips are produced outside of the U.S., like at this fab in Singapore. So being a fab is a big investment. And now the world is running out of chips because companies can't make them fast enough. When all the really flooding in, uh, we had to turn on every single piece of machine that we can find in the factory. The pandemic rattled supply chains and led to a surge in demand for electronics when people were stuck at home. While well, the perfect storm of natural disasters, a fire at one of the world's leading auto chip makers, and the ongoing US China trade war disrupted the production and distribution of semiconductors. This shortage has affected whether you can drive a Jeep off the lot or buy a new PlayStation 5. We visit one of the world's largest contract chip makers to see the complex process and why there's no quick fix to the supply crunch. Chip usually takes about two to three months to make. Daniel Rushmore is a manufacturing manager at one of the fabs at Global Foundries. The American company is the third largest contract chip manufacturer in the world. Companies like Intel, AMD, and Bosch give some of their circuitry designs to Global Foundries. And then its fabs like this one in Singapore manufacture the chips. Once we finish the uh, fabrication of the circuitry, it has to go for testing, it has to go for repackaging. Altogether, it could take as much as six months before a chip is ready to go into your tech. This long process starts here, at the center of the fat called the clean room. Before going into the clean room, we need to gown up. Because chips can be as small as a fingernail and crammed with billions of components, they have to be handled with great care. Any form of dust that falls onto the waitress will cause the chip to be detected. <laughs> And then now we are able to go into the air tower. Yeah. Global Foundry says this clean room is a thousand times cleaner than an operating room. And it also takes up a lot of space. Two football field, uh, that's how big it is. We have about seven to eight hundred machines. It's also yellow in here because chips are sensitive to UV rays, and this lighting has none of that. This is always the first step. The starting material for any chip is here in this room. These super thin disks are called wafers and made from silicon. Eventually, one of these will produce about 1,000 to 1,500 individual chips. But before it does, the wafer is placed in a special container. We have the raw silicon. We are now trying to register this material and transfer it into our wafer carrier. Each carrier can hold up to 25 wafers, and there are about 4,000 of these moving around the facility at one time. We are also the source of particles that we go into the clean room. So never once during manufacturing does the wafer come in contact with any of the workers. We will bring the wafers directly to the machine, and in this foundry, basically 95% of all processing jobs is fully automated. These raw wafers are cleaned before starting a process that Rajkumar describes as similar to making layered cake. The main function of a diffusion furnace uh, is basically to grow layers of uh, oxide or to uh, dab a nitride onto the silicon. That creates a protective coating. Next is a layer that makes the wafer light sensitive, so it's ready for one of the most important steps called lithography. This is the most expensive module in any wafer foundry. The number of lithography machines will define how many wafers you can produce in a month or a year. One lithography machine costs anywhere between $25 million to over $800 million. And that's because it's responsible for adding layers of the circuitry. 
basically electronic components like transistors and diodes that allow the chips to eventually store data or run apps. What I'm holding here is uh, basically a pattern design of a circuit feed. Inside this pink box is a photo mask, which is like a glass stencil, and clients send these directly to global foundries. The lithography machine blasts UV light through the photo mask and prints patterns on the wafer over and over again. The difference between an advanced chip for a 5G smartphone versus one for your credit card comes down to the type of wavelength that's used. Shorter wavelengths mean you can etch finer features and get more performance out of the chips. Some of these transitors are so small that they're measured in nanometers and compared to DNA strands. Once a circuitry pattern is imprinted, the wafer has to be charged. These machines use a lot of energy to produce uh, electrical charge that allows the uh, electrical to flow to the chip and uh, also creates a different type of function for your electrical chips. Rajmar says many of these steps are repeated hundreds of times before the fabrication is complete. And to get to this point, these orders have to be made at least a year in advance. I have a demo wafer here. The finished wafers are tested, then finally sliced into individual chips. One is the small die wafers, which is mainly used for bank cards or chips. And then you have the other one, which is a bigger die wafers, which can go into other kinds of applications like computer processing chips or electrical appliances. Global Foundry says its fab in Singapore typically makes about 600,000 wafers a year. But with the recent surge in demand, it's making around 120,000 more. This whole year is fully booked up. We don't have any more space for new customers. Tan Yu Kwong is the Vice President and General Manager of Global Foundry's Fab 7 in Singapore, and he says there's no quick solution. There's no space that you can house another lithography tool or any other tools that you like to buy. It is a least time easily a one year to 15 months before you can see a tool that is coming into your factory. It's not just a backlog of equipment, but Tan says expanding or building a fab from the ground up would require deep investments. More than the $1.4 billion that Global Foundries has already committed to spend this year on expanding its three fabs around the world. We easily need to spend $7 billion to $15 billion depending on the size of the factory you want to build and the technology that you're going to develop can easily take you decades to get the foundation. So to fill as many orders as quickly as possible, the company turned on idle machines and opened this factory control tower. Engineers here have a bird's eye view of the entire fab, and the green boxes show which machines are running at max capacity. Before this control tower when there was a problem, engineers have to sort through data and piece together information themselves. Compared to today, just looking at the screen, you already know that this is a piece of machine. You need to pay attention now. Tan says any time saved is precious, but to truly address the shortage, the company is working more closely with its clients, suppliers, and the government. We're going to continue seeing more government support because it is becoming such an important part of the entire global supply chain. There's no reason why America should work. We're investing aggressively in areas like semiconductors and batteries. The Biden administration has proposed $50 billion to boost America's chip production. That's because while the U.S. is one of the largest semiconductor markets, the majority of the complex and expensive manufacturing happens at a few companies based in China and East Asia. That's because the world's biggest foundry in the world, TSMC, is located in Taiwan. Samsung also has a sizable foundry, as well as some Chinese players. This concentration of fabs means any disruption to the supply chain, like a drought in Taiwan, or political tensions with China, can have big ripple effects, especially when global demand is expected to grow by more than 12% this year. We have technologies like 5G and artificial intelligence, and these types of advanced technology means that more chips will be needed to operate the devices that we use every day. To meet that demand, the Chip Industry Association says it will require an investment of $3 trillion globally over the next three decades. So for us to buy new devices, Tan says his fab will work around the clock as it turns this challenge into a business opportunity. From the uh... Okay, guys, so that was that. Um, so, you know, just some of the notes there, I think, from that video that we'll talk about is you can see how the, you know, semiconductors, the chips are manufactured on these wafers, 
Uh, unfortunately, I don't have one to show you, but they're typically about 12 inches now um, in diameter, like probably about this big if I was holding it. And basically they've printed these chips repeatedly on this wafer. And so if you get a wafer, there's a bunch of chips already on there. You slice those, you put them into packages, test them, et cetera, and, and then send them to your customers, et cetera. So one of the things you realize, and, and I think you know, one of the things they alluded to is that the manufacturing steps are, it's like a bunch of processes in series. You start with a bare semiconductor wafer. Again, this wafer, there's nothing on it when they start. And there's this repeated process of patterning, uh, you know, using lithography to pattern different shapes. Um, that represent your transistors on there. And then you, you take it through processing steps, more patterning, more processing steps. And a lot of those processing steps have to do with um, basically implanting or putting in different types of dopants into your silicon to make the transistors, to grow various silicon dioxide layers. Uh, deposit metal lines to get the connections between those transistors. Um, and then, you know, there might be, you know, hundreds and hundreds of those steps. And that whole process might take, you know, three to six months as this, this whole thing, you know, wafer starts to when it's shipped to the customers, basically. In between, you know, you'll still, you'll, you'll make the wafer, you'll package it off, test it. So making the wafer might take three to four months. And then it talked about how expensive it is to make these fabs. You know, it said a new fab is seven to fifteen billion dollars, and that also suggests how expensive that those wafers are going to be for you. Because you know, when a commercial company is spending seven to <clears throat> fifteen billion dollars making a plant, they need to make that money back, and they want to make it back you know, in a reasonable amount of time, I don't know, like five, 10 years, whatever, um, depending on how many years. And that, that basically you as the customer have to, you know, they're basically amortizing that cost, the profit they expect to make, then there's just the bare material cost and all that stuff. And so, you know, making a piece of silicon, making a chip now is, you know, that is very expensive. And it takes a long time. I think we talked about that a little bit. And, you know, these manufacturing facilities that talked about TSMC, which is, you know, the biggest um, and manufacturing facility in our company in the world. And they have the most leading edge technology and they're based in Taiwan. Um, what else? I think those are some of the, some of the important points. Uh, it made there. Did you guys have any questions about that? No. Okay. Again, it's just to give you guys an, a high level sort of idea of what we're going to be talking about. Um, so sort of building these things and a lot of stuff will will keep coming back to these things. Okay. So now, um, with that background, what I was going to do is this is the um, this is really a, to be interesting to see if what I'm about to say is gonna make any sense at all. Um, I'm gonna to try to give you guys some ideas about, um, some really kind of high level idea about what, why we're, why, you know, where does this stuff come from? What does any of this mean, okay? Why are we doing this? Um, let's see. I'm just trying to share my iPad with you guys. Okay. 
Okay, guys. Um, so I hope you're seeing my my note thing here. So, so okay. So we have these chips, right? These VLSI chips, semiconductor chips, the stuff that's in your iPhone or Mac or whatever, and it's this piece of silicon. And you know, I don't know how big it is. Typically, these are, you know, maybe you know. Um, there might be one, two, there's really no typical one to 10 centimeters on a side. And as of now, you know, there might be, you know, 20, 10, 20 billion transistors inside any of these chips. Okay, that and that chip basically, let's say, runs your cell phone, run all, runs all the functions of your cell phone. So, you know, the, I guess the question is, how and why did we end up here with this way of doing things? Okay, what's how do we how do we come to this point? And what are some of the limitations? Just trying to give you guys a real high level view. So this is the first time I'm I'm doing this. And this might totally be very confusing and may not make any sense. So stop me. If it doesn't, I'll try to explain a little bit of my thinking, but you know, that's how it goes. And, and it's, you know, some of this is like my extrapolations that might not be the, the, uh, the full truth. Okay, so first thing is, you know, I, I feel like there's two things that came together to bring us to this point. Okay, one of them is using binary math. Stop me if you guys disagree with this or your understanding is different than mine. I'm not a computer scientist. That's where this comes from. So it's one of them is binary math, and the other one is exponential growth. Okay, so let's talk about binary math first. So, so you know, um, there's this guy who's thought is, I don't know if you guys have heard of him, hopefully you have. His name is Claude Shannon. He's known as the father of information theory, which is a heck of a title. Um, because everything we're doing is information theory. And this dude, I don't know when he was around, I think he was around in the you know, 30s and 40s, et cetera. And he was, what he was trying to do is try to figure out a way to measure the amount of information in a message, okay? That was what he was trying to like get his arms around. So, and then how much information can you put into a message when you have a noisy communication path? Are you guys familiar with Shannon? Anybody's not heard about Shannon or any, anybody's heard about, from, about Claude Shannon? Shannon's theorem? I don't know if you guys have taken any communication classes. No? Can we get a okay. refresher? What's that? Oh, could we get a refresher? Sure, sure. I mean, this is just really like sort of historical background. So anyway, he was sure trying thing. to, the upshot, and you know, I'm not going to get into this, but the upshot is what he, the, the main goal he was trying to do is to, he worked at, you know, Bell Community, you know, Bell Labs, et cetera, which is a major um, R&D center in the, in the 30s, 40s, 60s, et cetera. So he's just trying to, he works for the phone company. He's trying to, figure out theoretically how much information is in a message, try to find a way to quantify that, and sort of how much information can you cram into a message when you have a noisy channel. And as part of that, he also showed that basically, you know, binary code, so this is a sort of offshoot of his work, is giving credit for that, he showed that binary code is the most efficient method of 
um, like data transmission. And therefore, probably most efficient method of data processing. Okay, so, and there is a, you know, I was looking at this book just this summer and they had a really cool illustration of this. So what is binary code? So, you know, you have, you know, decimal numbers and you have binary numbers, et cetera. So the example they gave about showing how binary is the most efficient method of transmission of information is, they're saying like, imagine if you had, you know, you wanted to do ship to ship communication. This is just a purely made up scenario. Okay, ship to ship communication. And I don't know if you guys have seen these old C movies, they used flags to communicate between the two ships. And let's say, you know, you wanted to transmit or communicate a number that would be between zero and 127. Okay, so that's your goal. And you want to see, like, look at the various ways of transmitting that information. Like, at, you know, in the morning, you want to say number 10, that means something to the other shit ship. And then at noon, you tell them, you know, 88, and that means something else, whatever it is. Okay. So, but you want to be able to transmit between the ships. Let's say you don't have radio or cellular communication. Okay. So let's say you try to do that with a single flag. So let's just say you, have, you just wanted to use a single flag to transmit this info. So in that case, you would need 128 flags. You need that, like each flag would have a number on it between zero and 127. You'd flash that flag and you know that then the information is transmitted but you'd need 128 individual flags in your locker or whatever the sailor would have to grab okay okay so that's not very efficient 128 flags you know don't have enough room in our locker second thing you could do is to use a decimal approach okay so a decimal let's say you wanted to transmit um, you know, the number 112. So notice in a decimal system, you know, we have three digits. So we would need, um, you know, we'd need to transmit each one of these in turn. Okay, so let's see how many flags we need. We need to have um, 10 flags for the units, right? Just for these guys from zero, through nine. So you need 10 flags for that, four flags for, for, uh, for the units. Then you need 10 flags to say, are you, you know, 10, or, or actually when you're in the units, whether you're 10, 20, 30, so for the, for the, the tens, so you need 10 flags for the tens. Okay, and then you need one flag to say, uh, shoot, flag, flag, flag. One flag to say, you know, for the hundreds. You're only going to 127. So you only need to say, you know, is this hundreds? Is it, are you from zero to 99 or are you in the hundreds? Okay, so overall, you would need 21 flags in your locker. Okay, so as in terms of the number of flags that you need, this is a more efficient coding system than just a single number. So you have to sort of decimal method, much more efficient, right? Seems significantly more efficient, what five times more, less, five X less flags, or maybe six X less, like six X less flags, great. So now let's look at binary transmission, if you were gonna do that. So to be able to do a binary transmission of zero to one through 27, 127, you'd need seven binary digits, right? You'd, you'd start, you know, zero, 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 zero. This would be binary zero. And this is, you know, one all the way up to all ones being the number 127. 
Everybody with me so far? Anybody lost? Okay, so, and then to the number of flags you need for this is you need seven flags for the zeros and seven flags for ones. Okay, so you need a total of 14 flags. So again, you're, you know, maybe almost a factor of two more efficient in your data transmission and data processing in a binary system than a decimal system and you know other systems. So this is kind of just to give you guys a, you know, I, you know, until I was read this thing in this book, I, you know, I kind of doing everything in a binary way in your computer science classes or uh, computer engineering or whatever. We talk about binary digital all the time. But it was never sort of clear to me why we were doing it that way. It was just a given. But it turns out that binary transmission is actually the most efficient transmission method. And you know, this is a silly example. And you know, the, the, there's much more detailed math, et cetera, from Shannon's theorem. But anyway, that's that's why binary is used. So what, what does that say? So it says, well. If you're doing binary transmission, then you probably want to do your processing in a binary way. And so you want it's you want sort of circuit elements that do can help you build and do binary math. Okay. And it just was convenient that you know, you know, around sort of the same time or soon after, et cetera. We have these transistors, and this is like a NMOS transistor, PMOS transistor, and these are, you know, switches. So in some really simple way, we'll see it's a little bit more, but not much more complicated than this. So this is a binary switch. You know, if you have a binary, we'll see this is these are really are going to be voltages, but if you called a, you know. For the sake of discussion, let's say I'm going to call zero volts binary zero. And then I'm going to call 1.8 volts binary, binary one. And if I put in um, zero, a binary zero here, and I have, um, I don't know, a binary zero here, it does not transmit to here. If I put in a binary one here in the form of a 1.8 volt thing, I'll get zero here. Or if I had a one binary one here, it'd show up here. I can use like transistors to do, we'll see how this works, but they're sort of switches. I'm using them as on off switches. I'm not using them as analog components where I'm looking at voltages and currents in fine detail, I'm just kind of looking at these as on-off switches, as good as I can make them. But they're really on-off working on single bits because you know I have one bit on a gate of a transistor and one bit that I'm transmitting through the transistor. Okay, so these are good to do binary. Okay, math. So it's like, oh, cool. Okay, we can use this for binary math. Okay. So that was the, this was the binary math. Now let's talk about this exponential growth. So these transistors, at some point, people will start thinking about, hey, transistors are good for doing this binary math. But when, when sort of computation started, before people started using semiconductor transistors, et cetera, they were using these things like they're called, you know, vacuum tubes. They're, you know, they're still in like high end stereo systems, et cetera. This is going back in sort of the 1930s, 1940s. And these are things that are about the size of, say, like a cigar, say, that's kind of the size and shape they're in. But you can't, you know, something that does one bit of computation and it's the size of a cigar, um, you know, 
you want to do a lot of competition. Imagine it, uh, you're trying to accomplish something like your cell phone does, where each binary bit is like, you know, each, each gate or each element is the size of a cigar that would be bigger than the United States. I don't know, I'm just making that up, but it would be just a huge area. So it was a big breakthrough when people started making, you know, people started working, playing with transistors. And, you know, I think the first transistor was, it's in, it's in those slides, hopefully I can open those up. But the first one was created, I think invented in, like 1947 or something. And initially it was just like, well, I can make this from this vacuum tube and you know, size of a cigar, et cetera. And the first transistor wasn't much smaller, kind of looked like the same, you know, it was a little bit smaller, but hey, what's the big deal? It's still the same kind of thing, et cetera. The big breakthrough came when they realized they went to this thing called the planar semiconductor manufacturing process. Okay, and what does that mean? That means they started being able to put, they realized, oh, I can put more than one, I can print more than one transistor on a simple single piece of silicon. Okay, that was like took some doing, but once they did that, they went, oh, I can put, um, four, you know, hey, let's start trying to get four transistors on there. I'm drawing these really badly. And then let's try to put eight transistors on there. But because of this manufacturing process, you could keep every, you know, as you figured out how to shrink the printing capability of your lithography, which you were, you know, refers to over there in part of your manufacturing process, you can start putting in more and more transistors onto a chip. And that, through a process, I don't know if you guys have heard about Moore's Law, which was, he was the CEO of Intel back in the day, he's, he's passed on. Um, since, but he made this prediction that the number of transistors on a silicon chip would double every 18 months. Okay. I'm not sure verbatim, I have Moore's Law right, but basically every couple of years, the number of, every year and a half, the number of chips that you could get into a chip, into a piece of silicon would double. And so that is called, that's an example of exponential growth. Okay, so one of the characteristics, I looked up the definition of exponential growth, and one of the characteristics is, so just going to say this slowly, is the last installment by itself is always the greater, is always greater than the sum of everything that has come before. So let's say if you're looking at exponential growth as you go from one, if you're doubling every, say, every cycle, right? You go from one to two to four to eight. And each one of these steps, so two is bigger than one, four is bigger than two plus one, right? Eight is greater than four plus two plus one. And so this is a huge level of growth. So we see that unfortunately in you know, COVID where things grow when you have this exponential growth type of function. It doesn't always have to be doubling everyone. It could be some other multiplication factor, but it has to be last installment, sort of has to be bigger than everything that came before it. Um, you have a very rapid increase in the number, very, very rapid. So I made a, um, let me see um, if I can share another screen. So this is a very, 
see here. Okay, so can you guys see my Excel sheet here? Hopefully you can. Yeah, so yeah we can see it. Okay, I made a real cheesy example of exponential growth for you guys. So I'd say, hey, so I, 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 you know, I'm not to make it simpler. I just said, hey, every year you double something. So I started with the year first year you got two transistors, second year you get four transistor, third year you get eight transistors, and so on. And I started plotting that. Okay, so this first one, and to show you how fast that number grows and then sort of right really picks up okay so here's this is the first few years i've plotted and it's hard to plot everything in one graph because it's hard to get a view so here's a plot of the first 16 years when you started from two transistors on a piece of the silicon and let's say you doubled every year again moore's law says every year and a half but just to give you guys guys idea of how powerful exponential growth is so by the six, you know, it starts pretty slowly, you know, year four, you still only have, sorry, this is year five, you only have 32 transistors. What's the big deal? And you know, I sort of improve, so I have somewhat of an improvement, but not great. By year 15 though, you have, um, by year 15, you have um, 130,000 um, or, something like that there's something between say 65,000 sorry by year 16 you have 65,000 transistors on a piece of chip okay so it really sort of picked up between years 11 and year 15. so this 64 so you can now get you can think of this as 64 let's say if these were mem binary memory elements you could think of these as 64 kilobits, okay? Now that starts getting interesting because it's about the amount of information you have in a single page of a book, okay? So now let's keep plotting, okay? So this is the same plot again. So I'm going back to year zero, plotting, plotting, plotting. By year, I don't know, 23, you have roughly a little bit over eight and see how much it picked up. This is year 16 here, which is what's plotted here. So see how much it increased again from year 16 to year, whatever this is, 22, over just six years. You went from being able to store a page of a book to the whole book. Okay, and then keep going, going, going. And then here I'm going to start, I'm going to have to start plotting stuff with um, on a log scale. So I change the number of transistors on his vertical scale to a log scale. Otherwise, you know, these things would end up in the same graph. You know, page of a book, book could just be too sharp. Um, you know, by year 30 or 35, you're talking, so, so this one times 10 to the ninth is a billion. So you reach that in year 29. Okay, and by year or whatever this is, um oops. by year 33 so three 33 years or 34 years after you started this dabbling you could put all the context contents of our dna so you can get that's about 20 gigabits worth of information okay in there. so it's a very this exponential growth along with the concept of doing binary math they've come together to get us to where we are. I think one or the other wouldn't be on you know, without being able to put all these transistors, this exponential growth of transistors per year on a chip, this business of binary data being more efficient than decimal data, et cetera, would just be a, a theoretical concept to me because like you couldn't, it's, you know, it's, you wouldn't be able to do a lot of computation. Um, but given the fact that we've been able to cram a ton of binary computational elements or binary memory elements onto a silicon, along with the fact that binary information is more efficient or information processing transmission is more efficient, the two of these have really come together to give us this desire 
and this ability to kind of be here where we are in 2021, where, you know, we have a lot of, you know, we have in our cell phones, we have a huge amount of information processing just capable in our pockets coming in all these years. So that was my uh, attempt to get you guys kind of understanding why we're dealing, why we do, why we have digital chips to begin with fundamentally and why is you know why is it interesting to have all this processing on a chip okay so i don't did that any questions about that i don't know if it made any sense but sort of just historical kind of a thing was, you know it's interesting to me so hopefully to you guys too as you figure out where we are so then um so the other question i have is why i'm having problems with my and I get this thing. Um, I can scroll. Scroll more. Okay. So, so like I mentioned, so we, there's this thing called Moore's Law. Okay, which says that we dabble every eighteen months. And this this happened for a while. Okay, for many many years. So this this whole thing started. Gordon Moore, I think, started. They made that prediction in the early '70s, and um, so sort of I'll show you some of the slides about the actual numbers. And it really was going like that for a very, very long time. And but you know, there's another uh, characteristics of exponential growth that we also maybe we haven't seen it yet in COVID, but hopefully we'll see at some day is that it cannot you know exponential growth cannot continue indefinitely we just we're gonna run out of atoms in the universe if it keeps going indefinitely or whatever people in the world or viruses whatever so all exponential growth eventually has to flatten out it's just the characteristics of exponential growth and that is also happening otherwise you know here we're like you know, looking at how many transistors we would have in our chips now, if Moore's law had really continued, you know, we'd be probably in the, you know, 100 billion transistor plus per chip, okay? So this Moore's law started flattening out at some point in the early 2000s. Um, for a couple of reasons, okay? One of the reasons was that um, it started getting, you know, to be able to cram more transistors into a single piece of silicon, you had to invest in more sophisticated production capability every 18 months, right? Because you're trying to, to get more transistors plugged into the same piece of chip, you also have to physically reduce the size of your transistors. Okay, so you have to make them smaller and smaller. That was easier back when you know transistors were 10 micrometers or 10 times 10 to the minus six meters, or you know, the size of three or four human cells. It was a lot easier to do it then than it is now. Um, but as time went on, now, like I mentioned, we're at like, you know, 10 nanometers, et cetera. It's talking about a piece, single piece of equipment costs like $100 million. Plus, there's not that many places that make this piece of equipment. They don't make too many of them. And, you know, you got who's got seven, $10 billion burning a hole in their pocket to build new manufacturing plants. So companies started slowing down their R&D spending. They said, hmm. Let's, you know, I already spent $3 billion on this plant. Instead of building a new plant 18 months from now, let's see if I can milk this existing plant for two years. Let's see if I can milk this plant for three years for a bit longer so I can recover my money faster. So this process of dabbling every 18 months, it started dabbling every 24 months, um, you know, now it might be dabbling every 36 months. It just depends on the market push and pull. It's just getting expensive, technologically difficult to 
you know, double in size. So things have flattened out. That was number, reason number one. Reason number two is power consumption, okay? So it's one thing to cram all these things next to each other. You know, you've got the real estate problem that you're trying to solve by making the transistor smaller and smaller, cramming them in, just physically packing them in next to each other in your 10 centimeters or however much you got. So that's problem one. But uh, as we'll see, each one of these transistors or each one of these functional elements, as they're doing their thing, they're actually using power. Okay, they're using electrical power. And that electrical power reads, leads to thermal power or basically leads to heat. As you're dissipating electrical power doing your computation, this stuff is heating up. And so I had another plot, which I didn't, I don't think I managed to complete. Somewhere here, I was trying to plot this thing, didn't, didn't get very far. But I was trying to say, hey, if you take the same thing and assume that each, say each transistor burns like 0.1 microwatts, which doesn't seem like a lot, right? 0.1 microwatts, that's not a lot of power. By now, by sorry, not by now, but even by year 33, which was what? Um, I think it was up here somewhere. Year 33 was when we could, I think, put in human DNA on our chip or 20 giga sort of elements, 20 giga transistors. You would be burning um, 1.7 kilowatts of, sorry, 1.7, yeah, 1.7 kilowatts of power, okay? Assuming each one had 0.1 microwatts, right? So it's an assumption, right? So what does that mean, 1.7 kilowatts? Now remember, this chip is like, it's not the size of a football field or a swimming pool or something. This is maybe a centimeter, 10 centimeters on a side, okay? And you're asking it to dissipate 1.7 kilowatts. Where, well, like the nozzle, the nozzle of a rocket engine, so imagine how hot, that's pretty hot, it's hot as stuff gets probably on Earth, is about a, a one kilowatt per centimeter squared. That's the power density at the nozzle. This is like stuff coming out of your rocket nozzle that's how hot it is. So that chip, assuming it was a centimeter by a centimeter in size, would get hotter in your computer than the nozzle of a rocket, which you know obviously is like can't happen. Okay. So that was number two reason why things start slowing down is power consumption. Okay. So as we'll see, people from generation to generation did a lot of things to reduce the power consumption at the transistor level, at the circuit level, at the block and functional level, et cetera. And so those are things that people are continuously doing to try to reduce the power consumption so they can cram more functionality onto a single chip, but there's only so much they can do, okay? because just, it just, you cannot dissipate too much power in a piece of electronics that's sitting on your desk or sitting in your pocket, okay? So, uh, and you can, you know, feel it, right? I mean, if you have a, you know, a bunch of, you know, laptop, again, you know, the fan in the laptop, you can feel it getting hot. Your cell phone gets warm when you're using it too much. And, you know, we'll talk about both of those things, both talk about, you know, the processes that, you know, we're reducing the size of transistors, reducing the type of circuits, what you can do to get do that. And then also how do you reduce, try to reduce your power consumption, all the different techniques you can do to do that. So we're doing on time. Um, so I'm gonna go, I think we're kind of, uh, you know, lost track of time a little bit, but it was, I was trying to sort of um, find a better way to describe 
the slides I was going to talk about. Let me see if I can actually put these slides. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go through the sl slides really quick because they were, I, you know, I, I wasn't really happy with the way they were um, describing this thing. But let me just walk through real quick the slides. Let's see if I can. So I want to do a new share. Let's see. Where are my slides? Here we go. So if you ever do manage to get the copy of these slides, I, I hope you'll be able to do it soon. Uh, and that today I hope you'll see sort of this discussion of, you know, this is really going back in time about first computers. These are, you know, it gives you a picture of a computer made with these uh, vacuum tubes and how big these were. This is sort of the first electronic computer that came out of just coincidentally, this stuff was being used in sort of in World War II to do, you know, ballistic calculations, et cetera. The first transistor came out in 1948, which you see it wasn't a, this is kind of hard to see, but it's sort of like this triangular chunk of something sitting on a rectangular chunk of something. Not too exciting at that point, because it's not a planar process. Where things started getting interesting is when you can put, started putting multiple transistors here. This one has, each one of these things, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but these boxes are trans. This has like six transistors in this chip in the 60s. So this starts getting interesting because we're putting more transistors, more and more transistors on a chip. This is 1971. I think this was one of the first microprocessors, maybe the one in the calculator with a thousand transistors. Again, going from the mid 60s with six transistors to early 70s, a thousand transistors. And this is, God, this Pentium 4 is probably like mid 90s. I don't really remember. Late 90s, probably has like tens of millions of trans transistors too. And this is this concept of Moore's Law where you know, transistors are doubling every 18 months and what that would mean. Okay, at that point it was predicting that this is smart dude is predicting this in the mid 1960s. And by the way, guys, this is sort of goes to something about technology. So I'm like, again, sort of going in a, in a tangent, but important lesson to be learned about technology. When you're in school, when you're studying physics, engineering, you think about, you know, facts are facts, things are coming from physics. These are the rules. But a lot of times things happen because somebody sort of sparks people's imagination or economically something makes sense. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So in some ways, Moore's law became a self-fulfilling prophecy because he predicted this, that got you know company management, et cetera, going, hey, I'm like doing the numbers. If you double this every 18 months, we can pack more stuff in here. We can sell, create more value, we can make more money. So they you know, would invest more in R and D. And so and then you know achieve that, get more profitable, grow their business, and so on and so forth. So this is kind of an example. You know, things didn't have to go this way if people hadn't put in the money into R and D, um, or they hadn't created the demand for digital processing. Um, they weren't constantly creating cooler gadgets to sell to us or to put into cars or whatever. Um, so this is kind of gives you an idea of how these self, you know, a lot of these things happen because you have somebody that persuades a whole industry to go in a, in a direction. And then sometimes you actually see it not working so well, right? I mean, this is an example where it really did, industry went that way, it paid off and they kept doubling down, literally doubling down every 18 months and then they kept winning okay so you know this talks about this thing that i drew that as you double up you get more kind of bits more functional functionality more information crammed into a space talking about the transistors going up and 
you know, die size is going up, et cetera. Speed's going up, we'll talk about this. And then this problem with power consumption going up, okay? And then how power consumption, you know, as it's, as if it keeps going, this is, a, this is some slides from, you know, years ago. And they were predicting if things were would go up too high, it would get things would get too hot, and so these have sort of slow, slowed down Moore's law. And this slide just talks about how um, processors are. You know, again, this is this is kind of an old set of slides. Back in the early two thousand nineties, no, yeah. I'd say late 90s, et cetera, for a lot of a lot of years, a lot of years, decades, most microprocessors would just go into PCs. Okay, that was the, by far the biggest one. But things, you know, this, the whole business with cell phones, et cetera, really, really blew up. You know, it got it got much bigger than the PC market to where we're sitting now. Um, and right, it, it started driving. This is why we started by I started by saying, look, Intel has been having some business difficulties because it never managed to really get into the cell phone space, which is what has been growing very quickly the last, you know, probably as as long as you guys remember. Now we're kind of starting to hit another inflection point. Um, it's basically like people already have everybody who wants a cell phone already has it. Um, you know, even people in the developing world have cell phones, smartphones, and you know, every once in a while you do get, you want to get a new cell phone, but we're talking about market growth. So that's just replacement doesn't create market growth. You need to have, you need to grow compared to last year. If you're just selling as many cell phones as you did last year, it's not helping your cause. So what's been happening is now we're seeing, um, sort of um, chip demand in automotive, in sort of security and in internet of things, those kind of things are going to be starting to already are the growth rates or they're, they're not, the volumes aren't as high as cell phones, but their growth rates are faster than cell phone growth rates. So that's, um, you know, again, this power of exponential growth when you have growth year over year, um, you know, that's where people are seeing the next big markets coming in automotive, whether it's self-driving cars or not, the electronic content, the chip contents of a car you buy, and whether it's an electrical car or not, are increasing every year. Um, the amount of electronics in your life that you won't even notice, that's, you know, every everywhere around you, in a room, it's not just in your laptop, it's gonna be everywhere. It's gonna be in your doors and windows and, and light bulbs and, um, you know, security systems and, you know, your Alexa, um, whatever things that listen to your voice, et cetera. And it's gonna be measuring everything in your house or in your manufacturing facility or your car um, so, you know, the guy at the gas company no longer has to come over to your house to read your gas meter or um, your car can figure out when some components going to break before it does. You know, you have those kind of sensors in your wheels right now that says, oh, I'm, you know, under pressure, et cetera. But, you know, having more and more and more of those everywhere in your life. So those, those are going to be the real growth areas. Okay, then, you know, I'm going to be talking about um, a little bit, I think we're going to start getting talking about this a little bit more in the next lecture, but I'm, this is where I'm going to end it, is all, this is all about the semiconductor space, okay, and what are the motivating factors, the motivating factors to cram more functionality onto a piece of silicon, uh, improve the speed of its function, make it more efficient, reduce the power consumption, and to control your costs. This class, you know, although we'll be getting into how do you make semiconductors, et cetera, very slightly at a real high level, just to give you guys some background, is about design, okay? So we're gonna be, when we're talking about 
the challenges in this class, we're going to be talking about not the manufacturing challenges, but design challenges. Okay, and you'll see that um, everything that comes to you know to try to define the quality of a design is this design. How is how good is this design? Is it uh, is it an efficient design? Is it a high quality design? Is it going to do what I want? Sort of comes down to four things, I think. Okay, first one is cost. This is immediately very important. It's not just something I talk about because I'm interested in business and economics. It's an important part of the chip design cycle. As you'll see, a lot of the design is about how do you make your transistor smaller, the size of your the, the size of your design, the way you set up your transistor structures, et cetera. How do you make that as small as possible to perform the function you want? So it comes down to size, cost and size, okay? Cost, so how expensive is your chip that you're making? Um, how much power consumption is that chip using? Because if you make a chip that has all the functionality that you need to sell it, but it's taken up too much power consumption. You cannot, your customer can't use it. How fast that chip's working, okay? Because, you know, you, you don't want long delays in your video processing or whatever. You want your camera to focus quickly. Everything you want in a tablet rapidly. If you want to swerve your car rapidly if something's coming at you and there's a chip controlling that car. Okay, and the last thing is reliability. Don't want your chip to make mistakes because it gets too hot or to shut down. If the if the, if the um, you know if you're in a sunny day or if your battery is starting to drain, etc. So we'll come down to a few things, but those things will um, define a lot of a lot of different aspects. Okay, guys, so I'll, I'll stop here. So, you know, unfortunately, I didn't have access to these slides. I'll see how I can free these up. But I, I think still we're talking about really high level things to give you guys an idea about why we're doing things the way we're doing them in the rest of the class. Uh, any questions? Okay, guys, if not, I'll let you go. Um, and I'll talk to you guys on Thursday. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Professor. Thanks, Professor. Thank you. Take care.